Thanks very much for the opportunity to present here today. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of our bigger group. Certainly if I say anything outrageous, feel free to take it up with them because I'll only be speaking on their behalf. Um, so what I wanna do is first take you through um, to understand when and where surgical complications actually occur. And then I wanna offer my own perspective on a historical aspect of what have been the real paradigm shifts in so far in the history of surgery. And then I'm gonna talk about um, where we're going with this and then also our new division of perioperative care. So I'm gonna start off with a case. So an 83 year old female, she has a history of hypertension and a 20 pack year history of smoking, had stopped smoking about 30 years ago. This patient had no known history of coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease and was known to have an ejection fraction which was normal at 60%. This patient was undergoing, uh, she had a rectovaginal fistula and was gonna undergo surgery for this problem. Now the patient um, normally takes candesartan for the hypertension and took the candesartan on the morning of their surgery, eight milligrams. February 7th is the day of the surgery. Um, patient has a lower anterior resection, loop ileostomy and a vaginal wall resection. It's a late day case, it goes from 1825 to 2200 hours at night. Intraoperatively, the systolic blood pressure is 80 for 10 minutes and it's 90 for 20 minutes, which is pretty unremarkable in terms of intraoperative hemodynamics. Postoperatively, the patient has an epidural in for uh, pain control and an IV running at 125 cc's per hour. When the patient arrives on the surgical floor, the vitals are taken for the first time and recorded. And at 2300, the heart rate is 91, and the blood pressure is now 110 on 55. The next time the blood pressure would be checked would be four in the morning, so five hours passes. Now, the first thing I wanna note is in our research, that's actually very unremarkable that there'd be a five hour difference between people getting vitals done. And the reality of just nursing to patient ratio is just such that you're lucky if you're getting it in these timelines. And um, at this time, the heart rate is 84. Now the blood pressure is 78 on 40. The surgery resident is called and the surgery resident is in the OR doing a case. And the surgery resident orders 500 cc's of normal saline. The next time the vitals are documented to be checked is two and a half hours later. The heart rate is now 76. The BP is 70 on 38. The resident is called again. They're still in the OR. Resident says, order a CBC and I'll be up as soon as the case is done. The resident arrives around eight in the morning, BP is 80, uh, heart rate is 80, BP is 75 and 36, hemoglobin is 94, and the resident orders a unit of blood and orders an ECG. This is the preoperative ECG, relatively unremarkable, no evidence of prior infarcts, maybe some borderline low criteria for LVH, but nothing very remarkable. This is the ECG that exists that morning in this patient. So we now see significant SC depression across the anterolateral leads, QS pattern, B1, B2, um, and a bit of ST elevation in AVR. At 10.30, the systolic blood pressure is now 60 and a code is called. We end up seeing this patient, we admit them to the CCU, give inotropes, give fluid, blood pressure normalizes as expected, troponins are elevated, patient is diagnosed with a perioperative MI, the next day, the patient gets 20 minutes of chest pain, goes to the cath lab, has an 85% mid-LED lesion, and ends up getting intervened on and does okay. But even though the patient survived, obviously this could have went in another direction, and ideally we would have avoided this whole problem in the first place by identifying early that the patient was heading the wrong direction and preventing the consequences. Now, for looking at the issue of surgical complications, globally, surgery is a very common thing. Over 230 million people will have major surgery on an annual basis, and this continues to grow. Um, we undertook a large international study called Vision. It was a prospective cohort study of 40,000 patients, global context, representative sample of people having non-cardiac surgery. And in the global context, 1.8% of people having non-cardiac surgery in hospital surgery will die in 30 days. Now in Western countries, it's about 1.1%. It's a bit higher in lower socioeconomic countries, but even in our own country, it's still a very high number. Now, most of us, when we are confronted with um, seeing experiences either through movies or books with people around the time of surgery, the most common scenario you see is a family anxiously waiting in the recovery room for the surgeon to come tell them if their loved one survived surgery. Now, the remarkable part about that scenario, which is very common is, 
surgery is actually become the safest part of surgery. So when you look at where do people die, of the people who are going to die, 0.7% of the deaths will actually happen in the OR. It's a minority of the deaths. The people who are gonna die 99, over 99% 99 of them will die after they leave the OR. And also what's important to know, and this is gonna grow in number because of our push to send people home sooner and sooner, essentially about 30% of people will die in the first 30 days after they've been discharged home. And obviously no one is sent home to die. It's just that people didn't recognize people either had events or at risk of having other events and people will die in that scenario. Also very importantly is that in a global context consistent across all the countries, 6% of people will be readmitted to a hospital within 30 days. And this, as I said, is likely to grow because we keep pushing people out the door sooner and sooner. So there's problems that confront us and remarkably where we've put our focus, we've had enormous advance in the OR. We've plummeted intraoperative mortality. 100 years ago, intraoperative mortality was actually a very common part of perioperative mortality. Now it's very uncommon. And now we have these big complications after surgery and we have consequences of this. Now in vision, when we look at all of the post-operative complications and we put these into models to look to see which complications are independently associated with death at 30 days, and we look at the frequency, the, the percentage of deaths, this table also shows you the adjusted hazard ratio, and it also shows you the triple fraction such that if that complication was truly causal of death, what proportion of the deaths it may be explaining in the first 30 days. And what you see is that three big events stand out, major bleeding, myocardial injury for non-cardiac surgery, which we call MINS, and sepsis infection. And those are the dominant pathways that we see in terms of relationship to 30-day mortality. This doesn't prove causation, but for certain we see lots of patients die of these events, and for certain it is accounting for a lot of the events and makes sense that we put our focus onto these events. Whereas you see things like VTE, which was a very common cause of perioperative mortality, has become way less common, probably for two very clear reasons. One is, it's one of the few things we've made advances in the perioperative setting with therapeutic e efficacy in terms of intervention, but also we mobilize patients profoundly quicker than we did in the past, and we have decreased the rate of VT as a result of that also. Now I'll offer you an historical perspective in terms of what I think has actually happened in the surgical setting. And um, there's many great books. One of my favorite books in reading on the history of surgery and anesthesia is The Butchering Art. And in The Butchering Art, it talks about the time which was really important for surgery between 1800 and 1850. And one of the really big problems that confronted people at that time was that we didn't have anesthesia. And so when you read in these books about people's accounts of how surgery happened, it's remarkable and it almost sounds completely crazy. So a common surgery was amputation. And so what people would do is they'd take people in the theaters and they would put them in four point restraints and then someone would saw off a limb. Now the upside of no anesthesia was people had to be extremely fast because people were gonna go crazy with pain. Now, because people had to go really fast, the impact of going really fast was is that what surgeons would do is they would commonly go into the anatomy lab just prior to surgery, practice whatever the procedure was, and then they would walk right into the OR and do the procedure because they had to be really fast at doing it. Now at the time, germ theory still wasn't established. People didn't understand that in fact, infection may be going on here. Now they recognized the concept of sepsis. It was a dominant reason why people clearly died. They saw these commonly after surgery, people would get these red pussy wounds. They thought it was inflammation and then there was high mortality with it, but they didn't yet understand that they weren't washing their hands, they weren't even changing their clothes, and they walked from the anatomy lab right into the OR and did surgery. Now, Joseph Lister, who was a surgeon who trained in London, he was obsessed with this issue of actual sepsis. And he went, he trained in London, then he went to Scotland, and, and he was completely focused on this. And Louis Pasteur was one of his good friends, and he kept going through what is going wrong here and doing this. And he came across the idea that maybe, in fact, we're bringing something from the anatomy lab into the OR. And he was one of the first people at the forefront of saying, maybe we should wash our hands, maybe we should change our clothes. And that ended up being a complete revolution. I think it is one of the paradigm shifts that happened in terms of surgery. So when you look at um, surgical mortality, when we went and introduced sterile techniques, it went from 46% to 15%, one thing that clearly worked. The next paradigm shift I think that has happened so far in the history of surgery is actually anesthesiology. So one thing was anesthesiology to make surgery so you could slow it down, we could have people focus on what they were doing. But the second thing that ended up happening with anesthesia was that we had someone who became focused and designated to be responsible for the patient's physiological stability in the OR, and anesthesiologists are very smart people. They're standing over people all day long looking. 
and they brought monitoring technology into the OR. And as a result of that, we have plummeted intraoperative mortality. So if you look 100 years ago, one in 1,500 people would die intraoperatively from an anesthetic complication. In today's world, despite the fact that 100 years ago, surgery was essentially done on young people with very little comorbidity, in today's world, it's much older people with lots of comorbidity. And in today's world, one in 200,000 people will die from an anesthetic complication intraoperatively. The monitoring and having someone available to respond, I think was crucial and I think was one of the paradigm shifts so far in the history of surgery to improve safety. And this is once again how I think these outcomes actually improve through physician being available and monitoring. What is the reality of today's post-operative care? In hospital, patients usually are cared for by their surgeon. And the reality is obviously surgeons are doing what they love doing. They're busy doing surgery. Um, and this can be a problem that if you become sick when someone's doing surgery, obviously that limits someone's ability to respond to you in a fast way. After discharge, patients are typically seen by a physician three to six weeks later. When we look at monitoring, in hospital, patients typically have their vitals checked every six to eight hours. In exceptional hospitals, and there's some, but there are few in our research, it's every four hours. The vast majority every six to eight hours. And after discharge, for the most part, patients are only going to be monitored when they're seen in follow-up three to six weeks later. I want to talk about the suboptimal monitoring and what happens as a result of this in the perioperal settings. This is a study that we published with Envision. We had 833 patients on a surgical floor after non-cardiac surgery, and we were looking at hypoxia. And nurses were told to measure vitals as they normally did, and on these patients, we had black box technology collecting a lot of vital signs that no one could see. And during routine care, the nurses said that 5% of these patients became hypoxic with an oxygen saturation less than 90%. Amongst the patients who the nurses said did not become hypoxic in the other 95% of patients, our continuous oxygen data showed us that in fact 38% of these patients had at least one continuous episode where the SAT was less than 90% for at least one hour, and 10% had at least one episode where the SAT was less than 85% once again for a continuous hour. If we look at the issue of hypotension, so this is a study that Dan Sessler, who we work very closely with at the Cleveland Clinic did, and the Cleveland Clinic is an exceptional center. They actually do get vitals every four hours on surgical floors. And in this study, they used the Soterra continuous blood pressure monitoring device where non-invasively you can get blood pressure, and they had 312 patients who just had abdominal surgery, and they used this continuous mantra on patients continuously, which was blindly collecting data, and nurses collected data as they normally did. 24% of patients based on the Soterra monitor had a MAP less than 70% for at least 30 minutes. The nurses didn't detect 21% of these events. And once again, this is in an exceptional center where in fact nurses are doing much more common vitals in most places. 16% had a MAP less than 70% that lasted for at least 60 minutes. 18% had a mean arterial pressure and MAP less than 65 for at least 15 minutes. And almost 50% of these events weren't detected. And once again, at much higher values, we see that people have lots of cardiac ischemia being the easier thing for us to measure, but likely brain ischemia, kidney ischemia, and other things are happening too. We look at suboptimal monitoring postoperatively for myocardial ischemia. In vision, we showed that 93% of the patients who develop myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery do not have ischemic symptoms. And if you don't measure troponins in these patients after surgery, you will miss these events. And importantly, because patients don't have symptoms does not mean that it's benign. This substantially alters the probability these patients are gonna die in 30 days and also changes the probability they're gonna have recurrent events in the coming one to two years. This is a trial that we published last year showing that these patients who get myocardial injury for non-cardiac surgery, that this is likely a modifiable event. We randomized these patients to an anticoagulant, um, dabigatran versus placebo, and we ended up seeing a benefit in terms of patients who had dabigatran and preventing major cardiovascular events in the subsequent two years of follow-up. One thing I want to draw your attention to is that we see that in the first two weeks after patients have a myocardial injury, there's a spike in events. 5% of patients are going to have a recurrent major vascular event. The curves then immediately diverge. They diverge until about one year and then remain parallel. But even at two years, we've not seen an obvious plateau in the curves. People are still having events. Now, Compass, and I want to you know, congratulate John, Jackie, and the group who did Compass. It's an enormous contribution, but I want to put things into context. So in Compass, which was looking at an anticoagulant in people who had known coronary disease or peripheral arterial disease, in Compass, patients were followed for a mean of 23 months. In Manage, we followed patients for a shorter period of time, 16 months. 
Despite that fact, when we look at the control groups in Compass versus Manage, in Compass, all-cause mortality, 4%, and in um, Manage, it's 13%. Cardiovascular death, 2% in Compass, 7% in Manage. Myocardial infarction, 2% in Compass, 5% in Manage. It's just to make the point that most patients who are suffering these events are not even recognized. Most people think it's not something important that has happened. We clearly all accept that people have coronary disease, peripheral arterial disease, it's a big deal and we need to focus on them. We're missing another group of patients that we're doing a disservice to that are having bad outcomes. If we look at the issue of also cerebral vascular events in the surgical setting, um, we published a study in The Lancet this past summer called Neurovision. We took 1,114 patients who were age 65 or greater having an elective non-cardiac surgery. We did brain MRIs in these patients two to nine days after surgery. 12 centers, nine countries participated. 7% of the patients using diffusion weight and imaging had a new perioperative covert stroke on their brain MRI. This increased, the ones who had the covert stroke had a doubling of their risk of perioperative delirium. And at one year, these patients had a substantially increase in the risk of cognitive decline. So it went to 42% had cognitive decline with a perioperative covert stroke, 29% who did not. And also the patients who had a perioperative covert stroke had a fourfold increase in the probability of an overt stroke or TIA in the coming year. Once again, these events would not be recognized without MRI, which is not a practical means to screen people after surgery, but it highlights more is happening in this setting than we detect in day-to-day -day care. There's other big issues that exist in the parapet setting. Missed opportunities, smoking. 18% of people in vision um, are smokers who are undergoing non-cardiac surgery. 50% will resume smoking within 30 days. Almost no patients in our research are offered prophylactic interventions with nicotine replacement. It's a huge missed opportunity. There's a need. I think we need to um, continue doing intraoperative research, which has really been the focus and we've made big advances, but we need to dramatically increase research outside of the operating room. We have to have a willingness to change structural issues and to be disruptive. We need to learn, I think, from the story of anesthesia. I think there's a potential for the third paradigm shift I think it has to have two components. I think that we have to move to a new type of perioperative care model of delivery. There needs to be physicians who are not doing something else that are dedicated to be available to respond to patients. It should ideally follow the model, I think, of ICU and be multidisciplinary. And these, patients, these physicians need to help transition patients into the home setting. And secondly, I think we need to bring remote automated non-invasive monitoring into post-operative care into the home setting to make sure we detect early when people are getting into trouble. I'll mention briefly now, I'm not sure if Mike McGillian's in the room. Mike McGillian is one of the key members of our group who's leading the SmartView trial. This is a randomized control trial of 800 patients having cardiac surgery or vascular surgery. And patients are randomized either when they get to the surgical ward after their surgery to just normal care or to get a Philips monitoring technology system. And um, when they're in the hospital, where you're able to get continuous heart rate, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, the Philips model has an inflatable cuff, which I'm not nuts about, but that's what we had to use in this model. And then this is being collected continuously and then alerts are happening based on certain scores of these things, which then bring people into care in these patients. And perhaps even more importantly is that when patients go home, they go home with monitoring technology. So when they go home, we get their vitals several times a day, we get their weight, we get their temperature, and we also interact with the patients every day. And one of the things that's most striking, you know, dealing with the nurses who are interacting with the patients every day is that it almost seems that drug error is the norm, not the exception. Um, and by patients being able to interact every day, we can look at their wound, we can get pictures of it, and we can escalate the care for these patients. And we're looking to see, can we prevent readmissions and ER visits through this technology? That is technology that I think is okay, but where we're really going, this will be part of vision two and what we see for POISE four trial. So this technology is from CloudDX. So that mantra around this woman's neck that can continuously give us non-invasive heart rate, heart rhythm, 5 lead ECG, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate, and positioning. And those are the kind of things where we want numerous biological, physical factors coming in continuously to try to understand the patterns that show us who's going to get diagnosed with a bleed or with infection or with myocardial injury two to five to 12 to 24 hours by seeing what changes are happening pre. And that's what we want to study in our setting. We've also created this division of perioperative care. It's both an academic and clinical service. It's multidisciplinary. It's anesthesia, medicine, nursing, rehab, and surgery. The clinical service is that we co-manage patients with the surgeons. Um, Emily Belle Cote has started our first model of this in cardiac surgery, so that when patients come out of cardiac surgery, they're now admitted to our service on the surgical floor. 
the surgeons show up every morning rounding at seven, but then there's someone designated seven days a week who's available to manage those patients throughout the time and they're not allowed to be doing something else. And once again, we're gonna be using the technology to transition people to home and having rapid follow-up clinics. So takeaway messages are, is that patients undergo surgery for important reasons and we should never forget that. And I also think too, I think we need to get to a place where no one has refused surgery. We need to make surgery safe enough that everyone can have surgery and benefit from it. We need to improve surgical outcomes to the point where everyone can have surgery. We need to implement what we know, avoid missed opportunities and conduct more research. I believe we need to learn from the history of anesthesiology and bring perioperative care to having physicians available and much better monitoring technology. And I think that um, with this, hopefully we can create the third paradigm shift. Thanks very much.